and welcome to the seventh series of the Maritime Impact Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Nyhus, Director Environment for Maritime at DNV. In recent episodes, I've been focusing extensively on the EU and of course, in particular, on the EU ETS and a few EU maritime legislation. While there will be more to say on these later this year, this time I'm turning back towards London and the outcome of the greenhouse gas discussions at the latest IMO MEPC meeting, namely MEPC 81, which took place in March. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And now, on to the show. As I trust everyone listening to this pod remembers, the previous meeting of the MEPC in mid-23 saw some pretty significant decision-making. In plain terms, MEPC 80 agreed that shipping should decarbonize by 2050. Applying constructive ambiguity, a pretty important tool when building consensus during international negotiations, the wording was left a little fuzzy, but have no doubt, 2050 is recognized as the target year. Intermediate goals were established for 2030 and 2040, 20% and 70% respectively, along with the target for 2030 of a minimum 5% uptake of zero or near zero greenhouse gas technologies and fuels. Bear in mind, all these numbers are on a well-to-wake basis. This means that the IMO has shifted to not only looking at what happens when fuel is used on board a ship, but also what happens during the production phase for the fuels. In simple terms, the emissions and sustainability aspects of the well-to-tank phase of the fuel life cycle are now being taken into account when the emissions from ships are calculated. Now, policy and regulatory developments are driven by strategy. However, it is only when we get clear and enforceable regulations that we can say that the strategy has really grown teeth. And that was also part of the outcome from MAPC 80. There was agreement that new regulations are to be established, entering into force in 2027, and that's only three years down the road. MEPC 81 was focused on progressing the work on these regulations, and that is what we will cover in the next section. So what exactly does this work entail? MEPC 80 agreed on a so-called basket of measures comprising two key elements. One is a technical measure aiming to regulate the greenhouse gas intensity of fuels used on board ships, the so-called GFI. The other is an economic measure imposing some form of carbon pricing. The agreed plan is for these measures to become clear MARPOL regulations, ready to be approved at MEPC 83 in April 2025, and then adopted at an extraordinary session of the MEPC in October 2025. That will allow them to enter into force in 2027, most likely becoming effective from January 2028. Based on that timeline, you will understand that MAPC 81 was not expected to come up with political agreement or agreement on the design of either of these regulatory elements. Instead, as there are numerous different proposals on the table, the meeting was intended to work the problem and move towards greater convergence on what the regulations should look like. This is not an easy or always smooth process. On the technical side, there are several proposals for regulation on the table, but there are two getting the most traction. One is fronted by the EU and directly applies the well-to-wake approach to calculate the greenhouse gas intensity. The other is spearheaded by China and applies a tank-to-wake approach to the calculation with additional fuel categorization and sustainability criteria thrown into the mix. Both of these proposed regulations are designed to meet the well-to-wake greenhouse gas intensity targets of the IMO greenhouse gas strategy, but there are political reasons behind these different approaches to the explicit incorporation of well-to-wake in the regulation itself. I want to repeat, in particular in response to some of the strange public commentary I've seen during and after the meeting, both of the proposals are designed to meet the IMO's strategic goals. I do not intend to do a deep dive into all the technical design features of the proposals. Still, I think it is significant to note that one key similarity between them is that both allow for pooling between ships as a way towards compliance, ensuring that flexibility is built in from day one. In a world where the necessary fuels cannot be expected to be available everywhere from day one to achieve the greenhouse gas intensity targets, this will ease the introduction and enhance the effectiveness of the regulation. 
In both cases, the mechanics behind pooling as part of measuring and reporting greenhouse gas intensity also open up for what in practical terms can be seen as an economic instrument embedded in the technical regulation. And here is an important aspect where the proposers take differing views. Those behind the EU proposal are of the view that a fixed bunker levy needs to be added to the basket of measures while a number of the supporters behind what China is fronting believe building in flexibility and pooling as an integrated economic instrument is enough. During MEPC 81, we did see what an optimist can construe as greater understanding and at least some convergence on a technical GFI regulation, and this was reflected in a general, though non-binding, agreement on a framework for the legal language that needs to be developed in MARPOL. This will be a key focus area for MAPC 82 in October. This also brings us directly to maybe the most difficult part of the MAPC 81 discussions, namely the economic measure or carbon pricing. In something of a recap of what we saw last summer, MAPC 81 was deeply split on the issue of a separate carbon pricing mechanism. The discussion remains focused on the levy, as there was no attempt by anybody to resurrect a potential IMO ETS from the shallow grave it was consigned to during MPC 79, but the views on the levy remain strong and divergent. In addition to the aspect just discussed, a key question is whether the economic element embedded in a technical GFI proposal is sufficient, or does it need to be supplemented by a levy? There are additional positions worth noting. First and foremost, we have some of the Pacific and Caribbean islands, supported by some other countries, making very clear that their central regulatory goal is a levy starting at 150 US dollars per ton CO2. This would equate to an add-on of roughly 450 US dollars per ton on the price of conventional fuels. These countries are generally positive to a technical GFI, but see the levy as a primary mechanism for driving down emissions. Then we have the EU, with some additional supporters, as already mentioned, viewing the GFI as a primary emission reduction mechanism, but taking the view that the levy is essential to enhance early uptake of alternative fuels by partially compensating for the higher price of the alternatives. Equally, or maybe even more importantly, the levy is seen by them as a revenue generating mechanism. Both of these groups see the funds as being used for enhancing shipping decarbonization efforts in various ways, and not least ensuring that equity is handled in a meaningful fashion. Broadly speaking, these levy proponents are also open to a fee-bait mechanism where some revenue goes to incentivize early movers. The third group, consisting of many, but not all, of the supporters of the proposal China is spearheading, are in general agreement with this envisaged use of funds but they are deeply and vocally opposed to the funds being collected through a levy. There are diverse reasons for this, but one core argument being made is that a levy is a tax on trade, and this will penalize developing nations more than developed ones, and is therefore utterly unacceptable. And this is where a bit of understanding of how MAPC works comes in handy. If we were only counting voices, we would see that levy proponents outnumber opponents almost two to one, and in a straight-up vote, the decision would be made handily. But MEPC almost never votes. It operates by consensus. And in this case, those opposing the levy include many very significant countries, meaning that a decision cannot be made without them being brought on board. This is maybe the thorniest greenhouse gas issue to be resolved, kind of an irresistible force meets immovable object type of situation. And this, of course, is where clever diplomacy needs to come into play. There could be potential for a grand compromise, looking at both the GFI and levy disagreements in combination, but we will most likely be at MEPC 82 before we see if this happens or not. But as alluded to earlier, I am an optimist and think that the member states actually will be able to hash out a broad framework agreement at MEPC 82, have it ready for approval at MAPC 83, and then adopt it in October 2025. This is the point where I have to apologize to the listeners who have been waiting patiently for me to discuss all the non-greenhouse gas stuff that happened at MAPC 81, because despite me geeking out on greenhouse gases, there were other things on the agenda. One highlight I want to mention is that two new emission control areas were approved, one in the Canadian Arctic and one covering the Norwegian Sea. Both of these cover sulfur and NOx, 
with sulfur requirements kicking in from March 2027 and NOx requirements entering into force in March 2026. Dates are, of course, subject to adoption at MEPC 82. For more details, including outcomes on air pollution, energy efficiency and CII, ballast water management, carbon capture and storage, the life cycle analysis guidelines and more, I want to refer you to our technical regulatory newsletter available on dnv.com. So to the key takeaways. MEPC 81 was yet another meeting dominated by greenhouse gas discussions. This time it was not the greenhouse gas strategy that was in focus, but rather the regulations that are to be developed in response to the strategy. The discussions were highly technical, but also driven by intense political positioning. And while we did not get a grand compromise on the entire basket of measures, we did see some convergence on the technical discussions of the greenhouse gas fuel intensity regulation. On the economic element and the carbon levy, there was very limited or no changes in position to observe. To weave both of these elements together in a common framework ready for approval at MEPC 83 in April 2025 remains quite a challenge. But, and here the optimist speaks again, one that I think the MEPC will be able to meet. You've been listening to the Maritime Impact Podcast from DNV with me, Eric Nyhus. This was a summary of the greenhouse gas discussions at MEPC 81. And needless to say, we will be following any developments as we head towards MEPC 82 this fall. Later this season, we will also keep on tracking the post-implementation progress of the EU ETS and explore the critical actions required for fuel EU maritime compliance, among other relevant topics that shall provide guidance for shipping's decarbonization journey. If you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to give us a rating or review. Thank you for listening.